businessman. That was my passport. Uh, it's called the fra passport fraud. That was another thing they charged me for when uh, I left the country. So you flee the country, and you wind up in Algeria, right? Mm -hmm. With Eldridge Cleaver, mm -hmm. who had set up his so-called government in exile right. there. What sort of fellow was uh, was Eldridge Cleaver at that time? Well, I know Gordon. I mean, I know uh, Gordon. I also know Eldridge very well. It's an interesting I, slip. Yeah, I know. G. Gordon yeah, Liddy yeah. and Eldridge Cleaver. Because they're both people that I'm uh, very much opposed to, but we, we still uh, have a certain affection and a respect there. Um, Eldridge is a tough guy, and he really, although he comes off as a Black Panther, he's really an establishment man. Eldridge told me once, uh, if I remember, and of course my memory is not that good, but I think I remember Eldridge telling me that he'd like to be the sheriff of the southern town where he could kick butt regardless of race, creed, or color. But Eldridge is a tough guy from a tough uh, uh, background, and, uh, uh, no. So did you bolt, or did he throw you out, or what happened? I escaped, literally escaped. Uh, yes, his, uh, he had me under, my wife under gunpoint at one time, and he had me confined to my apartment, and I literally had to escape. I, I wouldn't pretend to be able to characterize uh, the Black Panthers as they were constituted in the 60s and 70s up and down, but at least off what, what I observed in a few experiences, there was a definite militaristic aspect to the whole thing. Totally. I remember seeing Huey Newton speak at uh, Syracuse University, mm -hmm. and young college students willingly subjected themselves to something they would never do if it were a speech, let's say, by an ROTC recruiter. They were all patted down and, mm -hmm. and checked at the door, mm -hmm. entering the chapel. He was flanked by uh, henchmen, sort of, yeah, and, and they, yeah. they yeah. struck certain poses. Absolutely. Uh, you, you would be safe in guessing that they were armed, although I didn't oh, see the guns. No, they, they loaded guns it's, it's, openly, yeah. Sometimes openly, in this case yeah. not. Yeah. But, uh, you know, there was a whole, a whole paramilitary thing Absolutely. around it. The thing that's interesting about that is that, uh, and I, I got a kick out of it. Here are these young, strong um, black men who have been subjected to all sorts of uh, persecution and discrimination, and they get a chance where they can kick Whitey's butt, and they can pat down and search white college students. <laughs> they got a kick out of it. <laughs> Newton had, a, had a, a, a very charismatic presence. He was very handsome, wow. and he moved with great grace. Yeah. And as he walked toward the podium to yeah. speak at Hendricks Chapel at Syracuse, two of his bodyguards, or whoever, whatever they were called, moved forward and removed his cape mm -hmm. from his shoulders like he was a prince. It was a, it, in terms of theater, it was a great scene. Oh, the theater of Huey Newton. He had his picture taken in one of those Panama big chairs, and he's sitting there with his gun. I mean, that was good show business. It's as good as, it's as, good as uh, General Schwarzkopf. <laughs> so, so now, eventually you get out of Algeria. You're traipsing around Europe, but they catch up with you. Mm -hmm. And now you're, you're back in the mm -hmm. United States. And did you strike some kind of deal, uh, or...? No, I did three and a half years uh, after that. And uh, there were a lot of rumors about, uh, did I talk or surrender? Uh, listen, I did. Uh, I, I was two years over the, the uh, limits on this marijuana thing. Uh, they were keeping me in. When I came up for my last parole, after I'd been in for f almost five years, they said they didn't declined parole because I had lied on my application where I said I'd never been busted before. And they'd found out that in 1936, I was fined $35 for reckless driving, and they said that was cause to keep me in another year. So uh, I, uh, I was uh, released from the California prisons when Jerry Brown uh, won over Reagan, and I was uh, freed from the uh, federal prisons when uh, Nixon was kicked out and uh, uh, Ford came in. So when you went back into prison, you had no idea for how long that might be. For all you knew, you could have been in there for 10 more years or whatever. Well, to tell you the truth, I was trying to escape again, and I was working on plots of that. Uh, but fortunately, uh, the, uh, the uh, Nixon was forced out. And uh, all of this, by the way, this is bad B-movie stuff. And uh, I've written a book called Flashbacks, and yeah. uh, it's now out in reissue. And uh, it's being, it's being uh, moved around in Hollywood. There may be a movie made of... Uh, of uh, some of these uh, lurid and dubious adventures. Has there been talk about who would play you? Well, I like uh, Schwarzenegger. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fill in your own punchline, folks. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Fast forward from uh, the stories of days gone by we've been telling to 1991. You're going to have to educate me from the ground up because I am computer illiterate. I know this is a computer. 
You take it from there. Well, you know, how do you know? This is actually a, uh, it's a game machine with the power of a computer. This okay. is a, we're talking about a hundred, hundred and twenty dollar instrument here. Before, before I get into that, I should say that for the last ten years, I have been involved almost obsessively in developing computer software that will help expand consciousness, increase intelligence, and uh, generate or en enhance creativity. Because I'm basically a psychologist, as I think you know. And uh, there's been a resistance uh, against using computers in education because the professors don't like it because it seems it's too techy for them. And the computer people are interested in either business or in games. Uh, but a wonderful thing has happened, Bob, in the last two years. The power of Japanese electronic industry to produce handheld consumer items uh, is out of control. Every 18 months now, the Japanese produce a new computer or a new multimedia image processor that is that's 10 or 20 or 30 times more powerful than the last one and uh, about 10% of the cost. So that uh, this is a, uh, it's actually a game machine, but it's got a compact disc. Let me take it out here and show you. So that in your little computer here, this compact disc and you can have uh, you can pull off from your television set uh, the seven o'clock news and if you don't like Dan Rather you can have Minnie Mouse's voice you can edit <laughs> think about it uh, I think this is one of the ultimate empowerments of the individual and I give the Japanese a lot of credit the Japanese know that the money the big money is in small uh, ex inexpensive consumer items because hundreds of millions of people are going to have this thing and uh, instead of the big mainframes or the big television nets. This is going to allow uh, the 14 year old kid in the inner city to have the ability to uh, edit and uh, film and tape and uh, put their own ideas on screen that uh, perhaps NBC didn't have 25 or 30 years ago. This is very exciting. Let's hope you don't have to use this for a long time, but I'm told that you give a certain amount of money each year to the Alcor Life Extension Foundation which plans to freeze your head when you die, and then in effect, when they figure out how, they grow you another body. So something like that, yeah. Uh, there is a group called Alcor, it's in Riverside, California. They're the finest group of scientists and libertarians I know. I signed up to have uh, my head frozen, and possibly my body, if I can afford it. Uh, we're not gonna die, we're gonna deanimate, and we're going to hibernate, uh, and then, Hopefully, uh, we will be brought back. At the present time, Alcor Foundation has 18 people now frozen, some heads and some heads and bodies. Uh, they have over 200 people signed up, and it's, you do it through insurance. I pay $300 of insurance so I can be insured that if I decide at the last minute, I can get myself frozen. And by the way, I may not do it. This is an option. I don't want to give myself over to the worms and maggots or to the uh, microwave of the crematorium. I want to have that option. But also, I'm doing this in small groups, and I'm uh, working out a small group commune of some of my friends. If we like each other in this world, let's make a date. We'll meet in, uh, say, 2040 uh, for a reunion, if and when science uh, uh, works out the solutions. And by the way, uh, I, I feel that your attitude towards dying or immortality is a key. We're going to let him catch his time. Okay. Gordon, you just can't boogie. Probably not, but I can sing. Try it. Straight and slow. Straight, at any rate. Never heard of Gordon Liddy. 
I don't like him. What about Timothy Leary? I don't like him either. Timothy Leary, what, I grew up in the 60s, and uh, he was, what, made into some sort of a folk hero. Um, <clears throat> personal opinion, he's not a folk hero of mine. He sounds kind of crazy to me. <laughs> but I've come away with the feeling if we had 100 G. Gordon Liddies in Vietnam, we probably would have won the war. Timothy Leary, I don't know that much about him, but I equate him with freedom of, well, <laughs> of, um, it's very hard to have an opinion. I think just that there's been a lot of bad things. And I equate Liddy with... Leary seems to have some sense. Being a professor of psychology at Harvard University, a man of, of quite a bit of intelligence. And Liddy, to me, has um, fascist inclinations due to his authoritarian um, type being. Yeah, he's crazy. I think they're both a little nuts. <laughs> How in the world are they going to participate and contribute anything to society? Uh, I've not said the word dropout in 10 years. I tell young people, turn on, tune in, and take over. Everything is going to be legalized when the, when the baby boom generation. He's a very farming and engaging guy. Talk! Talk, Liddy! <laughs> put him down. Huh? I'm putting down on stage. Hemingway, and I'm here tonight to moderate this evening's event. You're here to witness a debate between G. Gordon Liddy and Dr. Timothy Leary, two men from opposite extremes. G. Gordon Liddy, Watergate, the mastermind of the bungled burglary. He had a code, and he lived by it. Dr. Timothy Leary, conducting scientific studies, was seen to have influenced a whole generation into taking dangerous drugs. These two men here tonight. Now, you wrote the memo of the separate DEA. Yeah. And you've masterminded Operation Intercept, in which you sealed off all the cities, allowing all the grass to come across the... Uh... Well, the purpose of Operation Intercept I know it was not as advertised. It was to seal the border so as to create economic turmoil. And we expected them to sue for peace in about 30 days. In fact, two weeks later, they said, what do you guys want? And what we told we wanted is, well, we'll give you all the airplanes. You guys have to fly them. It's going to be over your territory. And when you find the the opium poppy and the marijuana and everything, we dump the paraquat on it. So to stop American kids from smoking grass instead of uh, drinking horrible whiskey, you, you forced an economic blight upon the poor peasantry of Mexico. No, the poor peasantry of Mexico would stop growing marijuana. Uh, we wouldn't have to do things like that. Well, what is business? This is the American government. What the, the stuff was coming what the here. That's what I mean. Vietnam they want, and look, the, the Mexicans want to ingest the all that junk and whack uh, themselves Mexico out by the peasants. Peasant. So long as the peasants, you were using the peasants in Mexico. don't poison the children. And it didn't work, did it? No, it did work. It did work. Yeah, That's how we sure. got the Paracot yeah. program. Gordon, um, what movies have you liked that you see recently? I just saw this Road Warrior. And it's really good. That's your kind of movie. Really really You're one of the fathers of the punk movement in this country. I'm not sure I understand what the punk movement it's, means. It's, it's a me. compliment. <laughs> okay, because it means what it went when we were in the joint, you know, and I had to punch you in the mouth. No, 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 no. Uh, You're a flaming heterosexual. I've heard you say that. Yeah, well, that's true. Uh, that's a pretty courageous thing to stand in front of two or three thousand people and pronounce yourself as a flaming homosexual. You hetero, hetero, uh, hetero. hetero. Yeah. A, flaming, a flaming heterosexual, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, what's the response to that? Well, I Women must be attracted to that, are they? Well, I don't know. From time to time, I, uh, I have, for example, a young lady got up and in the midst of a discussion with the audience on the Iranian situation, asked my opinion of group sex. 
uh, you know, somewhat non -clo Well, I asked her, you know, how big a cloak do you have in mind? I don't know. Gordon Liddy and I met 16 years ago this spring. At the time, I was a member of a research group called the Castella Foundation, living in a large estate in Millbrook, New York. We were studying conscious alteration and mind-changing drugs. We were a rather middle-aged, middle-class group. Now, before we sat down to dinner that night, I made an announcement, it was a warning. I said, our spies, our agents throughout the county have told us that there is an ambitious young prosecutor in Poughkeepsie and a wicked sheriff who are planning to raid us tonight. So please stash your dope outside. Uh, about midnight, we uh, all went to bed and we're settling our brains for a long springtime nap, when suddenly out in the hallway there came such a clatter and smash, the door opened, and there, in my bedroom, <laughs> is this Peter Sellers as Inspector Clouseau? <laughs> no, G. Gordon Liddy, surrounded by 12 armed and booted deputy sheriffs with very unfriendly and nervous looks on their face. My wife, with great presence of mind, pointed to the corner of the room and said, don't touch my pot. As soon as those offending letters P.O.T. were said, 26 paranoid police eyes turned. Mr. Liddy walked over and said, obviously a high grade of marijuana. Label this for evidence. You're under arrest. Well, I was handcuffed, led to jail. I was never indicted. I was never tried because there were no laws against peat moss at the time. <laughs> there will, with the Reagan administration, I'm sure there will be. <laughs> but I must say this for Gordon Liddy. He's a man of great perseverance and intelligence, uh, so he kept harassing us. He kept busting us. He kept <laughs> braiding us. And he did indeed run us out of the county. Now, for this, he was promoted <laughs> to the Nixon White House as the world's leading drug expert. So in a sense, I feel I helped Mr. Liddy's career. And between the two of us, we helped bring down the Nixon administration. As you are about to learn, Timothy Leary and I disagree on virtually everything it is possible to disagree on in this world. And that includes the facts and circumstances surrounding our first meeting. Yes, indeed, he had set up a headquarters in a 1,500-acre estate in Millbrook, New York, which happened to be in the county in which I was an assistant district attorney. You have yet to see conservative until you have visited Dutchess County. Of all the counties in the United States of America, whatever possessed this man to set up his fruitcake headquarters in Dutchess County? I mean, what did he expect was going to happen? I am going to have a bit of difficulty this evening with the program because we are here in Los Angeles. And although I have been studying hard all week long to learn how to speak mellow as a second language, <laughs> I am not yet the master of it because every time I think I know what it is, I go to another party and I found out that you guys have all collected together overnight and changed everything the next day. <laughs> On a particular concept. Okay, for example, nine months ago, when the first call came in for the Liddy Lyric bit, that was not my idea. But what I did do is I all of a sudden said, wow, this is the way to elevate. At the time, Gordon was much bigger than you were. Unquestioned. At the time, Unquestioned. Gordon was getting 4,000. Yeah. You know, we were having our hands full pushing it. Hello, I'm Hi, Charlie. Hello. Hello. Nice to meet both of you. This is Ricky Marin, Chief Hi, Ricky. How are you? Nice to see you. My wife, Frances, Ricky Marin. And you are? I talked to the veterinarian in, um, in Washington. Yes. Right. I actually talked to his wife. Arnold, how are you? Good, Good to, to see you see again. You. Listen, my son, Tom. I saw, him once again, in, I, I saw him in Washington. I know he and, he, and, he, and he asked me again, you know, he figured that I'd see you here. Yeah. And he said, tell him once again, great job. Thank you very, very much. Oh, you're welcome. I promised to sign that man's book. Okay. Excuse okay. me, just a second, yeah. I want to sign oh, that book. Haven't. Here we go. Now, Saturn and uh, Mars changed places within a week. 
They went this yeah. way. Remember, uh -huh, they went this yeah. way, uh -huh. and now they're this way? Yeah. yeah. That's what freaked out the angels. That was their television show. Okay. Hi, baby. I think when my office got moved to the basement, it was probably uh, right around the corner from where you said you sat. Yeah, as uh, I in the room 16, probably. Yeah, well, you know. Because I was in the big office. You know where Nixon kept the tapes? Yes, I do. Now, medals one year. Yeah, my uh, my son recruited me into the effort. Yeah, your son graduated from St. Albans? Yes. With, uh, with, with my brother? Or yeah, Teddy, and Teddy. Teddy, Teddy, Teddy yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Because he was like a year behind my So then I really didn't have much chance to do anything or to grow very much because everything was. My full time while he was in prison was taken up with the teaching and with the children yeah, sure. and the lovely finances. It's you know? that you do that. Yes, it's kind of amazing when I look back at it now. Friends, I think it's time that you really bust it out. Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah. and we're in Hollywood with uh, the most intelligent, wonderful people. And uh, They say now yeah. that the funniest thing in the world with Gordon is he's the biggest name in Poughkeepsie now. I know. We weren't on the air at the time. They, were, they asked him for one, two, three, four, five, you know, a sound check. And he gave it to them. He asked me for a sound check. And I told him they were all under arrest. Nobody leave the room. Oh, oh. Well, my Heilman. He's still there. If he isn't dead, he may be buried by now, for all I know. Jim! I'd like to find him. <laughs> find him and bring him back. Bob's got the cocaine. <laughs> In my opinion, for us to achieve our human existential ends, we must cooperate one with another. Mutual supplementation and cooperation to achieve these ends. And without that, no culture, no music, no theater, no roads, no hospitals. No judicial system, no agriculture, nothing. Where does that lead us? There is a duality in the nature of man. He has an individual nature and a social nature. Morality flows from man's individual nature. If one is the only human being on the face of this earth, you still have morality. But if one is the only individual on the face of this earth, what need have you for laws? What need have you for rights? You are the only person here. Those things flow from man's social nature. And so there is this intrinsic difference between law and morality. And to the extent that the common good as a whole contains and subsumes within it the individual goods as parts to a whole, the common good transcends the individual good. That is, as you say here in Mellow, where I'm coming from. Thank you very much. That is where G. Gordon Liddy is coming from. Dr. Timothy Leary, where are you at? It's my duty at this point to ex expose my admirable adversary as a member of a very dangerous, disorderly, and destructive group. He cannot deny it. He's a self-confessed lawyer. Now, lawyers are trained in adversary process. They're intellectual hitmen. <laughs> lawyers worship precedent in the past. They are not interested in truth. They are interested, of course, in uh, marshalling evidence, cover up, twisting facts in every way possible to win their case at the expense of fact. The real difference between us, 180 degrees, is not left wing or right wing. It's past versus future. And Mr. Liddy is definitely facing backward, moving into the future, if at all, this way, <clears throat> worshiping tradition. And I'm a futurist. Now, I have news for Mr. Liddy. Gordon, history ended in 1945. In 1945, of course, that was the, the uh, time of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and nothing has been since the same, and politics really has to be shuffled in debt all over again. Most 
Most of those men that did combat saw it as a test of manhood, as a rite of passage. They saw it, unfortunately, they got addicted to it. I call this the Legionnaire disease. <laughs> the men who went to World War II and came back thinking that the goal of America was to conquer the world and to continually be at war with some enemy. Once you establish a war as your basic goal and defense as the first thing of a country, you've done something insidious and ominous and terrible. You've started another war on another front, the home front. Let's look, for example, at what the World War II generation has done since 1945. They have totally bleeped up. Take, for example, national security. After 36 years, in which they've wasted trillions of dollars of our precious national wealth, after they've killed several million people and wounded millions of people and really destroyed our morale both internally and globally, the military now come and say, the Russians are ahead of us. In other words, we're losing. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> the 1946 the most amazing event in our history, perhaps in human history, happened. Totally unpredictably, the birth rate doubled. That means that people born between the years 1946 and 1964 there are 76 million of you. We expected about 36 million. We knew that right after World War II, there'd be a little bulge, and then we'd go down again. But there are 40 million more of you than we expected. We had to double the diaper factories. We had to double the primary schools. We had to double the colleges. Now we're having to double the jails for you. <laughs> There's not more crime per capita now. It's simply that there are twice as many of you as we expected. My, my appeal to you, my logical invitation to you, is going to be as follows. Number one, let me take, talk to the Legionnaires. Gordon, please listen to me. It's time for you to turn on, tune in, and drop out. <laughs> and for those of you born after 1946, turn on, tune in, and take over. Thank you. All right. I, I would like to address just, just briefly a couple of those things, all right? With respect to the business of World War II, I would just point out that were it not for those fellows who are now in the American Legion and the other things that you have just mocked, we would all here be speaking either German or Japanese. You have to get to the point. It doesn't do you any good until you get to the point of pain, really. The whole idea is when you're in competition with someone else and you hit the pain barrier, you should welcome it because that means your opponents are experiencing pain and to the degree that you are able better to work right through the pain than they can, you will defeat them. In an exercise like this, of course, the contest is with yourself. This is a word processor. This is to the mind what Nautilus, the machine, is to the body. I use this to expand, uh, to accelerate, to strengthen my mind. I have my book, the complete manuscript of my current book, in this word processor. When I come to the final revision, I can ask one of the technicians here, and she will press a button, and my book will go directly to the printer. This has liberated the writer from the shackles of the big monolithic uh, printing presses and publishing houses. It encourages me to change, to improve, to grow. Gordon Liddy, uh, all of us know the um, story about your willingness to kill Jack Anderson for acts which you thought were traitorous to the United States government. Um, if he were here now, 
Would you kill him? No, and I'll explain that situation to you. <laughs> there was never any thought in those days of moving against Mr. Anderson physically, even after he had cost the United States of America probably one of the finest technical sources of intelligence information we ever enjoy. We were actually listening in as Brezhnev, Sejin, and other top Soviet officials would drive about the streets of Moscow in their big Zis limousines, speaking back to the Kremlin and car to car. They believed securely with their car phones. The Central Intelligence Agency was monitoring that, and we were getting all that information. Jack Anderson found out about that. CIA learned that Mr. Anderson knew it. It was so important that Richard Helms, who was then director of Central Intelligence himself, went to Jack Anderson. As a matter of fact, he bought him lunch and said to him, Mr. Anderson, please don't publicize that. We'll lose this fabulous source of information. Now, Anderson promised that he would not. Subsequently, he did it anyway. Still no thought of moving against him physically. It was not until word came that Anderson had just identified one of our human assets posted abroad the, with the result that the man was either already dead as of that morning or was about to die under exquisite torture that I was assigned to meet with Howard Hunt and a Dr. Gunn from the Central Intelligence Agency who was an expert on assassination and our task was to draw up a recommendation for a plan of action which would guarantee, that was the operative word, that Mr. Anderson would not repeat this conduct and kill somebody else. Well, one, they used the word guarantee, and I couldn't see how you could guarantee that Mr. Anderson wouldn't engage in any particular conduct again unless you killed him. And secondly, they had me consult with an expert on an assassination, which was sort of a clue. <laughs> this guy knew more ways to whack you out than there were moves on a chessboard. And so, we sat down and discussed it. And the first thing we discussed was whether or not we would be justified in this instance in a homicide. And I assure you, if there's anybody left in, in this country who does not understand that from time to time, for very good reason, this country engages in homicide. They do. That's against the law. Now, the position I took was, if Anderson had only betrayed or it was in prospect that he was only going to betray technical sources of information and we were not in war, then no, it would not be justified to kill him. Well, I just, want to, I just want to make one thing perfectly clear here, point of phrase. I'm pleading not guilty on all of this, all right? Well, you always have. Okay. That's why they gave you 20 years. He <laughs> also refuses to talk. <laughs> exactly. 20 more. Each and every one of us is a miracle. The position I took was, if Anderson 